I was initially going to wait to do a video on the flood, but since it was one of the main topics brought up in response to my last video, saying that Neanderthal were just humans from before the flood, I decided to address this first. While there are arguably more Muslim creationists than any other, I was a Christian creationist. For me, it was all about the Bible. Six literal creation days, which included days and nights before the solar system and most notably the sun, Adam and Eve, the Garden of Eden, and Noah's flood. The Bible says that God created every animal after its own kind, and that shortly afterward he sent the flood which destroyed all life on earth except for the animals on the ark, who would repopulate it afterwards. There are a few glaring problems when this myth is taken as literal. The main one for me is illustrated by Madagascar. Madagascar is an island country located in the Indian Ocean off the southern coast of Africa. Geographic isolation has allowed it to be an evolutionary microcosm for 88 million years. Over 80% of Madagascar's animals are unique and not found anywhere else on Earth. This is due to the forces of natural selection and genetic mutation working over many millions of years. The plants and animals were able to evolve in isolation. If the plant and animal life that exists in Madagascar today existed anywhere else, we would find living and fossil evidence. But not only is most of the current life on this island distinct from anywhere else, the fossil evidence we find there is also very different from others of the same time period. However, the differences are less pronounced because Madagascar split from India during the Cretaceous period about 88 million years ago. For instance, take Majungasaurus, also known as Majungatholus, a top predator. It was a Tyrannosaurus-like dinosaur, a theropod, but it was a very different animal. So if life was created all over the world before the flood, and some type of biological diversity was designed on Madagascar, that may make sense in a wishful thinking sort of way, but the flood should have destroyed all of this distinctiveness and made all life the same across the globe. But that was not the case. Before and after the flood is presumed to have happened, life is very different on Madagascar than on the mainland. Australia is another example of evolutionary change in geographic isolation. Australia is one of the most diverse countries on the planet. It is home to more than one million species of plants and animals, many of which are found nowhere else in the world. About 85% of flowering plants, 84% of mammals, more than 45% of birds and 89% of inshore freshwater fish are unique to Australia. Monotremes and marsupials, along with a host of extinct megafauna, are examples of unique animal life found only in Australia. The marsupial lion is a great example of an animal evolving to fill a niche in the environment. They lived only in Australia. Perhaps they all swam there, and all the dead ones too, because we don't find any evidence of their existence anywhere else. If, as creationists claim, after the flood, the animals migrated to the far reaches of the earth at different migratory rates, and that's how some places have very different species than others, then we should find evidence of these animals elsewhere. But with Madagascar and Australia, and many other geographically isolated areas on earth, that is not the case. At the very least, I suppose, creationists should concede that life does seem to evolve, but perhaps at a much quicker rate since it has only supposedly been about 4,000 years since the Flood. But admitting to that is unthinkable for most religious believers, as well as somewhat self-defeating, and ridiculous for most thinking people. How could the majority of the flora and fauna of these isolated places be distinct before and after a global Flood? The Flood legend amazingly claims global repopulation from a single species pair. For this claim, we must confront another serious issue, genetic bottlenecks. Now, before we knew anything about genetics, or reproduction, or, well, anything, stories and legends didn't have to take any of these pesky scientific details into account. Today we know that genetic bottlenecks present huge problems for individual species, and leave overwhelming evidence of their occurrence. The cheetah went through a severe genetic bottleneck during the last ice age. The inbreeding after this bottleneck is evidenced in the fact that skin grafts between unrelated individuals do not provoke an immune response. All cheetahs are almost genetically identical. Before 1492, there were an estimated 60 million American bison. In 1890, there were only an estimated 750. 
There are now around 400,000, but their genetic bottleneck has resulted in low genetic variation and reproductive problems. As an interesting side note, the ecological niche that bison flourished in was populated by Ceratopsidae in the Upper Cretaceous. Millions of Ceratopsids grazed in herds across North America. Over and over again, we see that animals evolved into available habitats that provided food, protection, and territory. Also in 1890, it was estimated that the population of northern elephant seal fell to around 30. This is causing reproductive problems now in the species. There are many other species that suffered similar bottlenecks, like the golden hamster and the giant panda. These events cause many problems for these species. Increased susceptibility to disease, reproductive problems, adaptability limitations. But the most relevant fact to the legend of a global flood is that these events left clear genetic evidence, and most species on Earth did not go through this kind of genetic bottleneck. Notice that in most cases, these populations reduce to a small community, not just two individuals. Even a small community of 30, or even hundreds, has severe repercussions for the species and leaves behind a record in their genes. Noah's flood would have left genetic evidence. And what about extinct species? It is estimated that 99.9% .9 of all species that have ever existed are now extinct. That is an amazing thought when you consider that before we knew of fossils, the thought that extinction could happen to any species was anathema, because it was thought that since God created every animal after its kind, and that he saw that it was good, he certainly wouldn't allow them to just go extinct. That would be wasteful and, actually, quite a poor design. Perhaps Noah didn't do a very good job in collecting a pair of each species. Maybe he fudged the books and got by with only one-tenth of one percent of all species. Actually, how could the Earth support that many animals all at once anyway? Creationists almost always dismiss geologic evidence of great periods of time by saying that the geologic layers could have been laid down quickly in the Great Flood. While floodwaters do lay down sediment layers, they do not lay down the same kind of layers as geologic processes. Sediment layers in the Earth, used to measure geologic time, are sorted by features like weathering, erosion, sedimentation, and radioactivity, to name a few. The KT boundary is an iridium layer under which are found all non-avian dinosaurs. Iridium is very rare in the Earth's crust, but it is abundant in asteroids. How did the flood lay that down? Good question! What happened here? No, I have no clue. They're willingly ignorant. They're, they don't have an answer. I mean, they have an answer, but it's a BS answer. It's an answer that wouldn't make sense to a small child. Another key indicator in geology are volcanic ash layers. Did the Great Flood lay down layers containing different types of rock intertwined with volcanic ash? And what about the sloth? How did it travel from Central and South America to the Middle East to get on Noah's Ark and then travel all the way back again afterwards? And what about dendrochronology? This easily disproves the flood because we can trace the age of the Earth back over 10,000 years through tree ring dating using cross dating and marker years. This would not be possible if a global flood drowned all of the trees, thus stopping the production of tree rings at one point in the chronology, making it impossible to date farther back in time than this event. The sequence of overlapping marker rings would stop at the time of the flood and then start again after trees started to grow. Genetic variation between Neanderthal and Homo sapiens is calculated by comparing genetic dissimilarities to the known mutation rates in humans. The span of time necessary to accumulate this level of genetic diversity is approximately 500,000 years. It is impossible to do so in less than 6,000, and no one would propose such a thing if it weren't for a strong need to believe contrary to the evidence. Much has been made about skin color over the years, and in our ignorance we considered it a major difference between people groups. We now know that skin color represents less than 10% of all genetic diversity between human populations today. In one fell swoop, modern genetics has made our traditional view of race obsolete. We didn't like evolve from anything. That doesn't make any sense. I mean, how can like an African American person evolve from a white person? We're different skin. Two Africans with the same skin color can be more genetically diverse than either of them would be compared to a non-African. We now know that the human race originated in and migrated from 
Africa. And what about glaciers and ice ages? The last ice age alone covered most of North America and glaciers. Glaciation has established time frames of tens of thousands of years for formation and recession, and the effects glaciers leave behind on the landscape, glacial moraines, drumlins, valley cutting, and the deposition of glacial erratics, are all solid evidence carved into the earth over millennia. Atolls are formed over a huge span of time, in which an oceanic volcano and coral reef gradually subside into a barrier reef island, and then to an atoll. This process takes tens of millions of years. James Hutton, in the 18th century, discovered the principles of geologic time and laid the foundation for modern geology. Geologic unconformities are the most visual and easily grasped principles. Angular unconformities form when horizontally parallel strata of sedimentary rock are deposited on tilted and eroded layers. These tilted layers are laid down long ago but were pushed upwards, eroded away, and sedimentation layers were deposited on top. This shows that no single event laid down all of the geologic layers at once. Many claim that the scientists who made these discoveries were just seeing the world as they wished to, and accuse them of looking for an alternate theory to belief in God. Evolution is the idea some people have to explain life without God. Well, Darwin was a very bitter man who went into the ministry, mm -hmm. fell away, never knew the Lord, and uh, lost his daughter at the age of 12, she was 12, and became very bitter at God, and then denied his faith, and then came up with this fairy tale for grown-ups. That is not the case. Geology, paleontology, taxonomy, and evolution were started often by creationists, who initially set out to prove some form of intelligent design. The scientific community in Darwin's day was primarily creationist. Early geologists set out to prove the flood. Natural history, paleontology, and taxonomy were solely creationists when they began, but the weight of the evidence was too great to ignore. The scientific community was forced to accept these theories and findings because all of the facts bore them out. Listen to this quote. Another source of conviction in the existence of God, connected with the reason, and not with the feelings, impresses me as having much more weight. This follows from the extreme difficulty, or rather impossibility, of conceiving this immense and wonderful universe including man with his capacity of looking far backward and far into futurity, as the result of blind chance or necessity. When thus reflecting, I feel compelled to look to a first cause having an intelligent mind in some degree analogous to that of man, and I deserve to be called a theist. This conclusion was strong in my mind about the time, as far as I can remember, when I wrote The Origin of Species, and it is since that time that it has very gradually, with many fluctuations, become weaker. But then arises the doubt, can the mind of man, which has, as I fully believe, been developed from a mind as low as that possessed by the lowest animals, be trusted when it draws such grand conclusions? I cannot pretend to throw the least light on such abstruse problems. The mystery of the beginning of all things is insoluble by us, and I, for one, must be content to remain an agnostic. Before Darwin, in the early 19th century, Georges Cuvier, the head of the Natural History Museum in Paris, led the fields of biology, geology, oceanography, mineralogy, and paleontology. He was a committed Christian and believed and taught that God created all of the forms of life. He opposed the idea that organisms evolved, but his work laid the groundwork for later discoveries that would show beyond the shadow of a doubt that all life did indeed change over time. It wasn't a takeover by anti-God warriors. It was a slow and reluctant change, even against the will of those making the discoveries. The early leaders in these fields would have loved nothing more than to prove that God created the world and everything in it, and some of them were big enough to accept the facts when they ran contrary to their own personal beliefs. And eventually, the scientific community accepted evolution and deep time based upon the evidence. Don't fall for the lie that most scientists today doubt evolution and the Big Bang. That is one of the most insidious fabrications told in creationist circles. There is so much evidence now that it's overwhelming. When I was a creationist, I read most of the literature on the subject of intelligent design. It's not hard to do. When I decided to look into the claims of evolution, geology, cosmology, and astronomy, paleontology, and taxonomy, and other disciplines that contradicted my opinion, I thought I could read all of the literature as well. I found out that, though you can read all of the creationist literature in relatively little time, I couldn't hope to read all of the other side of the issue in my lifetime. Well, and that's the thing. It's not a two-sided issue. There is no controversy to teach. The creationist viewpoint is a position of denial and poorly worded and empty arguments. The Bible says that God told Noah to bring seven of every clean animal and two of every unclean animal. 
Why was Noah supposed to sort the animals based on the Hebrew dietary laws that hadn't been given yet? And furthermore, there would have been no reason for clean and unclean distinctions because they apparently didn't eat meat before the flood. Near the end of the Old Testament, there are many names, dates, times, and places given. Many tedious details are listed ad nauseum. But the farther back in the Old Testament you go, less and less details are given and more and more generalizations are made. This is because the Old Testament was compiled a few hundred years BCE by Jewish religious scholars compiling oral Hebrew myth into a comprehensive collection for the purpose of religious observance and national solidarity. The accounts of creation and the flood in the book of Genesis are stories, of which lessons can be gleaned, but that's all they are. Once you see that, all of the scientific evidence, all of a sudden, makes sense.